All right, guys, we are live once again. This is episode three of the Illusion Breakdown series. Today, we'll be talking about illusion for kids and family shows. Where you are, check in uh, in the chat box. Tell me where you are in the world. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask, please go ahead and do so. We are going to have lots of fun today. Now, I started out doing kid shows. All right, so just like many of you guys uh, i did oh, i started out close up and kid shows at the same time but my first show was actually a kid show so i did do the whole kid show circuit for at least let's see kids maybe th two three years at least uh, and then i went on to family shows so it's still a very strong kid centric audience so i was doing at least you know five years of my life was performing professionally for uh, kids and family audiences so don't think I just started out as an illusionist. Uh, hardly anyone starts off as an illusionist. So I did do the whole kid show circuit, uh, working out of a case, going to birthday parties, going to people's homes, doing all sorts of venues from uh, clubs, association, company picnics, family days, malls, attractions, uh, you, you name it. Okay. So I've worked a lot of kid shows, a lot of family shows. Granted, there's some time ago, but some of the fundamentals don't change. And a lot of events I do now, especially public events or public shows, there's still a lot of kids in my audience. Of course, my branding is a bit different, which I'll get to in just a bit and how that affects your choice of material. But uh, basically what I'm trying to say is I do have experience in this field and that's why I'm gonna talk about it. So let's first talk about why would you even want to add you know, large stage effects or illusions to kid shows? Uh, your kid show, maybe you're already doing a show with a change bag, you know, uh, some silks, some rope, cards, everything's good, everything packs into a small briefcase and you kill and, and, and you do well. Well, if you are working for a specific market, you're doing well with your show and you're completely satisfied, yeah, you're right. You don't need to add any anything to your show. But if you intend to maybe increase your bookings, get more shows or increase the fee that you command, or maybe take on work that it's different from what you're doing now, maybe higher value work, then this is one possible route to go. Of course, it's not the only route to go if you are kids or family entertainer to be more successful, but this is one possible route. Because when you add stage illusions or even just large scale stage effects to your kids or family show, you are increasing the production value or the visual scale of the show. I'm personally very for production value. Well, that's why I'm an illusionist, right? But I do know that commercial audiences, uh, especially when they're paying a more premium price, besides the entertainment value, they're paying for your brand, they're paying for you know visual production value. What are they getting from the show? You know, while we know that of course production value is such as you know big props, good-looking props, sets, lights, costumes they don't really uh, you know, enhance the magical effect necessarily, right? But they do enhance the overall show experience for the audience. And when a client pays for a show, they are paying for an experience. And visual production value is part of the experience to many clients. So therefore, when they do pay a premium, they either expect to see it or if they do see it, they understand why they're paying a premium because of added production value. So when it comes to a kids or family show, uh, if you have nice looking big props, effects that play large, that fill the stage or fill, uh, that can be performed with action happening at different parts of the stage at one time, this increases the visual production value of the show, the visual aspects of the show, and therefore increases value to your show. So what happens when you increase value to your show? Well, there are two things really. One, you are likely to get more bookings because your value is higher and if clients recognize this value they want to book you so assuming your fee remains the same you'll be getting more shows which is great now if you do not want to take on more shows but you want to increase your show fee this is great as well because when you increase your value you can charge more because clients are now willing to pay more because they see more value so two ways that can happen when you increase your value by increasing the scale of your show. You can get more shows, so you can increase the value of the show. Uh, that is your show fee. Of course, I should mention, it does depend 
on the primary market that you work in, depends on the country or city that you're in. Maybe you're in a location that regardless of how much value you add to your show, there's no way you can increase your price. That's just the reality. And I understand that. So there are two things you can do. One, be happy with that and do what you're doing and charge the maximum amount that your market can hold, the threshold of your particular show fee. Or you can change your market. Maybe if you're just performing for kids' birthday parties and there is a threshold to amount of money that people can spend for a kids' show, maybe you need to try to, uh, I won't say need to, but maybe you like to try to go to a different market, maybe move up to the corporate family event market or maybe work attractions and venues which requires show to entertain kids and family audiences. Or you can change your geographical location. Maybe it's the town or the city or even the country that you're in that just can't you know, afford to pay a very high value uh, or high fee for a show. So maybe you might consider moving out. So I fully agree. It is possible that the current market you're in will not allow you to increase your show fee or increase your value too much. So you have two options. But let's just assume that there is a possibility because I should also mention there are a lot of times when you at your current position think that it's not possible for your show fee to be increased. But that's because you're working within your reality and your bubble, your bubble, your own bubble. For example, for myself, when I started doing magic, there were only three you know, professional magicians in Singapore at the time, and they were telling me, if you want to do magic, the only way you can become professional is if you do kids shows. And the price that you, you can charge is basically X amount. And this was their reality and this was what they told everyone and i well when i first started i didn't know any better so of course i used that as kind of a starting point however i soon realized that that was not the reality they just had a glass ceiling above them it was a false reality and over the years of course i moved past that you know whatever amount they felt by you know maybe 100 times so the market was much bigger than we actually knew. Of course, there is always a threshold, but chances are if you're in a lower level market or mid market, you know, you probably can charge more. Let me just, I know this is not really a discussion on the business side of it, but let me give you a quick example. If your market has a celebrity, not necessarily a magician, but any kind of entertainer, whether it's a singer, whether it's a variety artist, whether it's a comedian, and if they can charge a premium, um, I'm calling arbitrary amount, they can charge $10,000 a show, $50,000 a show, and your average kids magician, let's say, is charging $200, $300 a show, then I can tell you for a fact, your market can actually support that higher price of value if they see there's value. But if there's, you know, even if your top celebrity or top uh, performer can't charge that premium and they're only getting, you know, three hundred dollars a show, then I would agree. Then you're probably if you are if, if your ceiling is a hundred dollars, it could be a very reason. But someone a celebrity in your town is charging, you know, ten thousand dollars a show for you to charge just one tenth of that, a thousand dollars, is very possible if your market sees value in your show. Okay, but I'm digressing from this particular webinar, uh, but I think it's important of why or to justify or give reason why it might be useful for you to explore performing larger effects and even illusions, even though it may be just kids or family shows. Let's talk a bit about practicality because that's the thing about large props, right? Anytime you do some kind of large props, it means you have to lug around more things. It means more weight. It's harder to transport. It's, it's just so much trouble. And is it again worth it to do it for your particular show? Once again, it goes back to uh, how much value and how much you can charge. Now, if you want to increase your value and therefore increase your fee, then it might be worth it. For the simple reason is likely many people are thinking exactly how you're thinking. They're thinking, how can I pack small, play big? I just want to squeeze everything in one case and I want to set up my show in two minutes and I, and I can go in and out and that's great. Yes, that's, that's a very practical approach and uh, I totally understand that. I, I have that thinking in me, although my definition of pack small, play big is a bit different, but definitely I, I, I am constrained by practicality. 
But the thing is, I was also come to realize that the more trouble you go to, whether it's you know in setup time or the scale of a prop or lugging around bigger props, the chances are you can differentiate yourself because no one else is going to do that. And if you're going to be performing stuff that no one else is performing, that gives you a unique value, which is why someone would pay you more. Ren Woodbury in his book, Diversions, he had an illusion which was uh, basically an illusion where a girl became or uh, transformed into a uh, tank full of goldfish. And he explained how, you know, probably very few people are actually going to perform the illusion, but those who actually go through the trouble uh, would have a very unique illusion. And he pointed out how different, very successful magicians, those who went the extra effort to do stuff that no one else wanted to do because it's just too troublesome or difficult to do, they generally set themselves apart and are more successful. So something for you to think about. Let's talk about designs and presentations for illusions and large scale effects for kids and family shows. You know, if you if I look back at magic, maybe call it 30, 40 years from, well, let's call it from the 60s. So we're already talking almost 50 years now, more than 50 years. You get all these magic props, which are you know, colorful, bright colors. Uh, they don't look like anything on earth. They look like kids' magic props. You might have motifs of dragons or tigers, or you might have even oriental characters because they're supposed to be uh, objects from the oriental east. And I can tell you, most of the characters are wrong or don't mean anything. So any Chinese characters you see uh, produced by non-Chinese uh, magic manufacturers, chances are those words don't mean anything. Uh, now, those may work You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, maybe 25 years ago but in today's day and age you really have to look for something much more cutting edge much more topical much more recognizable in today's terms you have to update the designs i've no problem with colorful props i think that the illusion props uh, or large-scale props should be colorful for hit shows i think that's part of the visual spectacle and you know, if I think back as a kid when I was watching a magic show, I definitely enjoyed all these interesting uh, props. But, you know, in this day and age with the kids, you know, where, you know, most of them are playing their iPads, their phones, their game consoles uh, at a very early age, they are definitely exposed to much more high tech and modern uh, instruments or devices than you would uh, when you were a kid. So you need to consider that. So anything that you might have seen as a kid, uh, you know, as a magician watching those uh, kid magicians perform with those props, uh, bear in mind, call it, let's say that was 10, 15, or even 20 years ago. These would be alien to uh, the kids now because it will be 40 years actually behind from their perspective. So whatever props you use, Think about redesigning them. Even if they're classic props, I'm fine with the classic props because classic props are great. They are time tested and they work. However, think about the design. I'm talking about the aesthetic design or even giving motivation or justification of what this item is. Of course, you might be thinking, hey, these are just kids. Uh, they won't know any better. But remember from the business side, the commercial side, that your paymaster, the person who actually pays for your show are the adults. They are the parents, or it could be the management of the association club or venue that you've been booked to perform for. So while they do largely see how entertained the kids are and what the reactions of the kids are, that it's still the element of judging a show from their own perspective as an adult. So if they see a show, and let's say they have two shows to compare, and all things being equal, but one guy's props are bigger, more relevant, more modern, and look better, I can tell you they're going to have a better impression of that person and will likely book that person again or maybe spread the word. So it does make a difference. So I would say, you know, update your designs. You know, maybe it looks like a giant iPad or it looks like a jumbo phone or it looks like game console. Uh, give it reason. Uh, you know, I like to supersize items for kids' shows. So any recognizable item they might have, make it big and funny. That's fine. That's one uh, device, actually, to make things funny or to have a comedy element, and that's to supersize uh, these items. And, you know, this makes your show more modern. It looks more current. It can connect to the kids better. 
and I think it's it's you know just overall branding for you to be as a commercial kids and family entertainer in today's market you need to position yourself against kids other kids entertainment so you know what are the latest cartoons on the you know cartoon network on nickelodeon what are the live shows what are the hosts talking about what are they uh you know what are they wearing? What props or devices? What's the studio sets like for these types of shows? Now use that as benchmarks and uh, you know you have to design your show and your props to reflect the current shows to be topical and relevant. Your presentations themselves, they have to be more sophisticated and cool. So again, you know, presentations that may have worked 30 years ago, of course they, fundamentally can work now but again you know may seem very dated uh and you really need to update the presentations especially even in the tone of how you present to an audience uh, many entertainers talk down to the kids uh and that really doesn't work now or it works for a much smaller age group for example a general magic show 30 years ago might be able to entertain kids between 3 to 12 years old but i can tell you the that same show now could possibly only entertain kids between three to six. By the time they hit seven or eight, they, you know, because they're much more educated, they're much more exposed to things, you know, because of the internet and just because of how our world has changed. You know, simple magic tricks and presentations where you talk down to them just won't cut it with them. They are going to be either distracted or they feel it's a lame show uh, or they'll just start looking at the phone and Googling your tricks or who knows what they're going to do, right? But the point is that th that presentation that would have worked 30 years ago can't work on that same wide age group uh, as now. And especially if you're doing a family show, so you're talking about young kids, you're talking about teenagers, preteens, adults, young adults, old adults, seniors, even more so if you have a presentation which talks down you know to the kids or just isn't very hip or cool you are going to lose a big part of your crowd so presentations have to be more sophisticated scripting has to be more sophisticated uh be more topical uh bring in current things that are either happening or devices or items you know bring in pop culture you know Again, I, I'm not talking about any specific script. I'm talking about an overall approach that you should adopt, even though it's a kids and family show. Okay, let's talk a bit about uh, family shows. Because when we talk about birthday parties, I think that's a very specific market, especially if you work for a certain age group, let's say between that three and eight year old market. Uh, because now, you know, a 12 year old, uh, kid might not have the same type of birthday party uh, as they would have, you know, t uh, many years ago. So they may not even hire a magician, or maybe they want a street magician, some someone who's completely different. Or they they might have an outing, you know, to to an attraction or amusement park. So a very completely different way of celebrating a birthday party. So I'm going to expand now my talk specifically more for family shows, and it's great because many kids magicians already will book family shows. And the great thing about family shows is, chances are that it is a higher value market. You can get paid more for the shows. So family shows can encompass you know, family events uh, by attractions, malls, venues, corporations, clubs, and associations. So they're often, you know, it's a company paying, organization paying. It's not an individual, it's not parents who are paying you know, to celebrate their child's birthday. So you have a bigger market, you have maybe more competition, or they have more choice because when you work, let's say, uh, one of these family events, you're not just competing against other kids, magicians, you're competing you know, with other kids entertainers, whether it's fates, painters, clowns, jugglers, ventriloquists, uh, theme shows, you know, from cartoon shows where they have the live shows with mascots, all these are your competition. So if you want to try to fight, especially the higher end of the spectrum, you need to be able to have that scale, that sophistication in your illusion props or your just your props in general and your presentation to be sophisticated. So 
you know, that's, that's again, more on the reason of why you can consider working with larger props. So maybe let's talk a bit about the sources of these large scale props illusions. So where, where are you going to get them? Well, there are a couple of manufacturers who do, you know, have these props designed specially for kids and family shows, large scale magic props. In, in the category, you'll probably find them under stage magic or kids magic, uh, Mac magic, frontier magic, Owens magic, Abbott's. They've got a whole catalog of great effects. You might need to buy them and then think of a way to update some of the prop designs because some can be quite dated. However, there are also builders who build custom stage props or limited edition stage props, which look really cool, very, uh, I would say, contemporary for today's market. Chance Wolf, Smoky Mountain Magic, both of them make you know high quality props and they've got great artwork, which can be customized for your market. And I think uh, you should check them out. High-end illusion builders, of course, can build anything for you, but may not be practical from a price standpoint. But for example, Tim Clotier, he's got a burnt and restored shoe, which is, you know, just looks like some modern day mad scientist magical contraption. Very expensive, of course, but looks extremely high-end. You can also check out some books. Uh, Paul Osborne has a couple of books that can be uh, adapted for you know, family and kids shows. In fact, I think generally that's his style. Although I do find some of his designs uh, a bit dated, but his background was performing for amusement parks and attractions. So it's really a family audience. So his designs are really suited for uh, kids and family shows. So check out those books for inspiration and the basic methods and concepts, but see if you can redesign them so they look more modern and more topical for today's modern audience. I have a book called Pack Flat uh, Magic or Pack Flat Illusions for Kids and Family Shows. Uh, that's got a couple of illusions uh, which are designed, not just illusions, but you know, uh, larger scale props that fit a modern audience. And I'm working on a second book as well. I'm working on it right now. Hopefully that'll be out maybe in the later in the year. So a lot of illusions, which of course are performed uh, for a general stage audience can be adapted for kids and family shows, but you might have to change the look of it or even change the uh, props or accessories use of those particular illusions. All right, let's have uh, a discussion on specific illusion. I won't say specific, but maybe just a discussion on a direction of illusions you'd have. I, I would, you know, uh, suggest whatever if you have an illusion let's say even only just one illusion because you might not be doing a full illusion show for kids you might just have you know a few larger scale e effects and uh, one big illusion try to have it uh, involving a kid because that's a great way to sell your show after it's a great way to involve the audience and you know Kids like to see, you know, their fellow peers, right, on stage. The adults like to see a kid on stage, or the parent would love to see their kid on stage. Uh, so it's 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 good for everyone. So what do I mean by involve a kid? For example, a very common example we use a chair suspension or suspension effect, where there's a flying carpet, a super X, or a chair suspension illusion. You know, if you can float a kid in the air, uh, that's great. It's a great effect. But what's even stronger is if you can grab a photo, you can take a photo and then post it on your social media channel and you know give out your card to the kid and tell him or her to tag him or herself on your social media platform. Of course, if you're working through an agent, then you shouldn't be giving out your contact info. Then maybe you can tell them uh, or ask a parent or friend to take a photo of the kid floating in the air and then find you on social media to tag you without actually giving out your social media information. I think that still skirts the line. I think that's fine. But that's a great momento for someone to have, you know, the kid or themselves floating in the air and having that as a photo uh, digitally, which they can share on social media or eventually print out if they really want. So if you can involve the a kid in an illusion, have them be part of it, even if they are assisting you on stage to, you know, push a button or push something in or, pull something, even if it's just pseudo pushing, right? You are doing all the work, but they are pressing a button and something happens. If you can involve them, that's great. I think that's a, an excellent uh, kids 
or family illusion to do. However, if you are doing any of these interactive or audience participation illusions, I would steer clear of dangerous illusions or any illusions which might seem dangerous. Uh, different people have different views on this. I understand both views. I think a lot depends. I mean, there are just so many variables. So my short answer would be never do any kind of illusion that is dangerous or perceived to be dangerous or something where a kid might go home to try to replicate and uh, perform. Even, you know, like taking a straw, pushing up your nose, pulling it out or doing a, a skewer through tongue. Now, these are sight gags and many magicians do it as throwaways. But, you know, it can be potentially dangerous because if a kid sees it and tries to replicate that at home, uh, things can go bad. You know, forget whether you, you are liable for legal action or anything like that. Just the fact that someone can get hurt should be good enough reason not to do it. So personally, I would steer clear. If you are branding yourself as a kids and family entertainer, I would say steer clear. Now, if you're an adult entertainer and the kids happen to be in the audience for whatever reason, and you're doing a dangerous effect, then you know have a disclaimer. Tell them not to do it at home. Tell the parents, you know, to explain to kids that they should not do this at home. Then I think it's fine. Because, I mean, if you are an adult performer, you're branded as an adult performer, you are performing in a more adult venue, not necessarily adult as in risque, but just not a kid-friendly venue or not a kid-centric venue, I think it's perfectly fine. Then the onus is on the adults to ensure that they don't do anything silly. Uh, I say that also because in my show, my illusion show, which is not a kid show, uh, I do have, I guess, dangerous effects. I could do a you know, buzzsaw sawing effect but of course i do have disclaimers you know I, I tell the kids you know if in a kind of joking but serious way right you know if kids if you're scared do this you know it gets a laugh but at the same time many kids do do that because they are scared but it's great because then parents will either cover the kids eyes or just tell them you know you know not to look or, or whatever and i and i think it's fine uh but again, it's very personal. You might think if there are kids in the audience, you shouldn't do any kind of effect that's dangerous, and I respect that. Now, what if it's perceived danger? You know, I know, again, it depends on your city and your country. There's a lot of political correctness going on. For example, I know a lot of magicians or kids entertainers will not make swords or guns in, uh, from balloons. Right? They won't twist, they only make animals and no object which might seem like a weapon. Uh, I personally think it's fine. I guess if I was a kid's entertainer, I might possibly still do it. But I can see, again, because it is really geographical, uh, centric and sensitive, uh, I can see why making a gun is a bad idea. But I guess if you make a space gun, I think it's fine. If you make a sword that looks like a lightsaber, I think that's fine. But again, it's really up to you. Because I can see if I were to do an illusion, if I were to do a sword box with a girl, instead of using real swords, using balloon swords and you know putting it into the box and then showing the girl vanishes. Personally, I think that's a great illusion for a family audience. But I can see if, if you might think that, oh, that's no good because it looks like a sword. Then you still could use balloons, just don't twist it as a sword, I guess. But of course, I think it's common sense, you know, you shouldn't have any effect or illusion which is legitimately dangerous or even perceived to be legitimately dangerous so no smash and step roulette illusions uh, that should be very obvious no razor blades and needles in the mouth uh, none of these illusions so if you're doing any of these big illusions i think uh, make sure you think about that or substitute you know uh, the item so if not for swords put in balloons i think blades are still okay you know, if you take a blade that doesn't look really sharp or serrated, it's just a rectangular sheet of metal, I personally think that's okay. So I'm not really telling you what to do, what's good, what's bad, uh, but I'm telling you to think about it based on your own location, based on your own uh, audience, and based on the fact that you brand yourself exclusively as a kids and family audience. Uh, and if I were to say anything, my advice would be just be safe, you know, 
don't don't do it if you if you if, if, even have to think about it and think that there might be a chance someone might be unhappy with it then i'll say just don't do it there's so much effects so much material uh, out there you don't have to confine yourself to dangerous effects you know keep that for your adult shows i'm gonna end off uh talking about sucker effects okay because i think a lot of big scale effects and illusions work very well as sucky effects and sucky effects are great because oh, we know right as entertainers especially if you have done kid shows or do kid shows you know sucky effects can play long and you want effects that can play longer play big you get great uh, responses from the kids because they laugh they shout and if there's a strong ending they go wow the end and of course, the shouting and all works very well, right? If you're doing a sucky effect where the kids are shouting, no, it's over there, it's not over there. It, it makes for a very rowdy atmosphere and gives the illusion that the kids are actually uh, are having a good time. And you know, if your booker or the parent is not really watching a show, but is in the area and they hear the kids react, they naturally think it's a good show. I know some kids performers, uh, you know, have, have the thinking that sucky effects aren't great for kids because the kids are shouting, but they aren't actually enjoying themselves because they're agitated because they think that you're doing something, trying to try to fool them and they're not fooled. I can see that as well. But I think, you know, that that's a very uptight way of looking at it. It is, after all, a magic show. We can have a range of emotions. Having the kids, you know, vent out by shouting a bit, screaming a bit, I, I think that's perfectly, you know, fine. So. I acknowledge that uh, opinion. Uh, personally, I I don't buy too much into it. But I bring it up because maybe you haven't considered that, and that is important to you. But sucky effects. So what sort of sucky effects I'm talking about? Sliding die box. That's one of my first kids' effects, and I got a nice big one from Davenport. Okay, big is relative. It's it was sizable. Okay, and to me that was my one of my first big props. But it's great, it's three-dimensional, it's big, and the effect is you take a die, place it into a box, and you obviously tilt it to one side. There's a sound because there's a weight inside, so you hear the die apparently slide to the side, and then you open the door to show that the die has disappeared. Of course, the kids go crazy and say it's on the other side, so you close the door, tilt the die box to the other side, it apparently slides to the other side, you open another door to show it's vanished. And of course, the kids go crazy, and then you go back and forth as many times as you can. And eventually, you open all the doors to show that the box is completely empty and the die has actually vanished. And that's the nature of a sucky effect. You are kind of leading down, down one garden path, or you're doing a set of actions which the audience apparently sees through. But at the end, there's a magical effect which is strong, and basically, it fools the audience at the end. So that's the nature of a sucky effect. I think it works really well for a kids and family show. I think many big stage props and illusions can be adapted for sucky effects. Now, if you look at one of uh, Dave Copperfield's old specials, he did the classic Run Rabbit Run. Now, Run Rabbit Run is a, it's a bit like the sliding die box, except you've got two houses and you have a rabbit in one house and the audience always sees the rabbit move from house to house. They visibly see it move uh, without your apparent knowledge, of course. Now, David Copperfield did a big version with his uh, duck, Webster. So it's a run, duck, run, where the duck would apparently move from one, uh, I guess, house, large house to the other. And obviously, there's a guy who's actually moving it. At the end of the day, the guy, you know, vanishes because the table that the houses are sitting on is, you know, covered with a tablecloth, but that's removed and the person has apparently vanished. So that's the sucker effect. So think about how you can create sucker effects you know, that are not always seen. So there are many variations of sliding die box and the uh, run rabbit run. There's been run dino run, uh, which is great with the whole Jurassic Park revival. There's uh, a pizza box, you know, where a pizza rolling pizza, pizza slides from side to side. And that's been done also with a cookie. And, and you can be basically any round object, right? Basketball or uh, soccer ball. So, you know, but these are very common now, I think. Uh, again, of course, it depends on your locality. Maybe no one in your town is performing that, so it's great. But in a competitive market with a lot of kids' performers, you might need to try to think of being a bit more original and think of how you can change things up. 
So I would say, yeah, go ahead with the sucker effects. There's absolutely nothing wrong. But what I would suggest is how you present them. All right. I would say, you know, a lot of the old sucker effects are asking the kids, where is it now? Where is it now? Talking down to the kids and asking the kids where they are. And the kids, you know, they start shouting. Great for the young kids. Older kids may think it's just lame and they'll just switch off. Adults, of course, will think it's lame. So I suggest, you know, try to have a more intelligent presentation when you are presenting a sake effect. So instead of talking down, maybe don't ask the kids, where is it now? Where's the rabbit now? Where's the ball now? Narrate or tell a story. Maybe you can say, I was performing this for an audience just the other day. Now the audience weren't as smart as you guys, but let me tell you what happened. I performed this effect where I took a ball, I pasted it into the box, and I told them, I'm going to make it disappear. And I did this. And you took the box and it moves. And they all said, the ball, and I told the kids, the ball has disappeared. And you open the door and it's disappeared. But of course, we all know the ball has not disappeared. It's moved to one side, just like you guys think. So now you're kind of doing a circuit effect, but you're telling a story acknowledging that the kids who you are performing for know exactly what's going on. So the kids don't feel stupid because they don't think that you think they are stupid. So they're kind of playing along and kind of, yeah, I'm smart. Yeah, I'm the smart one. Not like those stupid kids that he performed for last. So that's an interesting way to perform it. And at the end, of course, there's a sucker and everyone's food and the kids all get surprised, but they don't, they aren't agitated or upset with you uh, or thinking that you look down on them. So that's one way to perform it. And if you're perform, performing a sake effect, always make sure the adults know you're doing it tongue-in-cheek. So kind of play to the adults and the older kids to let them know that you know they're in on it. And this helps, especially with the older kids who you know think that everything is lame. So if you kind of you know have them on your side and acknowledge the fact that they know what's going on, they kind of play along and then they, they enjoy the act by seeing how the smaller kids or younger kids react by going all crazy because there's a sucky effect. So always acknowledge the older kids and the adults when you're doing a sucky effect. You must have a resolution or closure to a sucky effect. So for example, you make something vanish, like a sliding pizza, right? I think it's very important to always have resolution by making it reappear especially for the younger kids. The younger kids need resolution. If not, they'll start thinking, they'll start <laughs> looking around, they'll start talking or screaming. So one resolution, for example, for the pizza is to appear on the performer's back. So it's either hooked on or velcro on. And that's great because after you show the pizza, it's vanished. You now turn around and all the kids see the uh, pizza on your back. And that you know that can that goes uh, allows you to play much more comedy because you know you turn around where is it they'll say behind you turn around no it's not behind me they'll say no it's behind you you start turning around you know there's so much uh, comedy that you can inbuild it but more importantly it creates closure for this type of sake effect so when you're thinking of a sake effect always think of a closure i personally like you know the silk to egg because it's another sort of suck effect because you're kind of teaching them in effect. So they feel they're on your side. So they feel happy, right? Because you're teaching them in effect. But then there's closure because now the egg suddenly transforms into real egg. Well, maybe there's no closure in the sense that where did the plastic egg go to, right? But from magical context, you have now done a magical transformation. So I think that's okay. And because the way it's presented, you're not agitating them. You're teaching them some magic all the way. You're leading them down the garden path. So they're kind of happy with you to be you know, in the know. So the sucker's more of a, whoa, that caught me off guard, more than uh, I'm angry all the way, and then now it's anticlimactic. So always have closure. So I'll end this session with, with an idea I had uh, for a sucker illusion. Okay, I haven't really worked out all the details, so it's just an idea, but something you can think about. So imagine this. You have a box on stage. Uh, it's elevated on views. You have a girl, and she goes into the box. And then now you have a tray of different cups of different liquid, different colors liquid. So there's blue, orange, green, yellow, all bright colored liquid. And you tell them you're going to show them something really amazing. You are going to pour the liquid over the girl, 
and she is not going to get wet in any way. So this is amazing vanishing liquid on girl or something. So now you take the cups and you're going to pour them into the top of the box uh, one by one. Now, as let's say you walk behind the box and you step up in the box, so you're elevated, and you're going to pour the liquid in the box. Unknown to you, the front of the box opens up. It could be a roller blind, or it could be a screen, or it could be just a door that opens up. And the, the audience actually sees the girl inside all kind of squashed up in that box. But now she's got different containers, a cup. And when you pour it in, she kind of collects the liquid in her glass or her con container. And this you know, is repeated with three or four different liquids. And you are making it seem as though you are just pouring the liquid into the box. To the audience, you know, they see the girl inside collecting the liquid. Now for the small kids, of course, they're going to be screaming, ah, they can see what's going on. The liquid is not going on the girl. You know, the liquid is not vanishing. To the older kids and the adults, you know, if the girl plays it up well, she's squashed up and she's kind of juggling different cups and, you know, acting all comical as she's collecting the liquid, that is very entertaining in itself. So, you know, you pour this all in. After you've poured in the last glass of liquid, the girl, of course, closes up the uh, roller blind on the front. Now you tell the audience the, uh, you know, the liquid has completely vanished and the girl is completely dry. Of course, the kids will be going, no, no, it's not going to happen. You open up the box, and now the girl is shown to completely vanished. And then you can say, you can see dry as a bone. And that's a great sucker effect because, wow, where did she go? They thought they saw, you know, collecting liquid. But of course, it's a complete sucker because it's not about the liquid vanishing. The girl has vanished. Now, to give closure to the illusion, you close up the box, snap your fingers, open it up again, and now the girl appears but her costume is completely changed. And now let's say she went in with a white costume. Now her costume has all the different colors on it. It can be in the form of stains. So it's all like she's all dirty and stained with all the colors, or it can just be a tie dyed colored costume. But you're given closure, great sucker effect, great effect magical as well, but at the same time given closure. So that's an idea for you for a sucker illusion. If you like, you can use it, you can build it. Use there are a variety of methods, you know, I'm not, this is not really about discussing the methods, more of the idea of the presentation. So think about it. So this ends the session on illusion for kids and family shows. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, by them away, I'm going to just check. Anyway, we've got someone talking about SpongeBob to Pikachu. Yeah, that's very, obviously, yeah, that's a great idea of being topical, you know, working with the app, working with a actual item and somehow making it appear great idea so think along these lines uh make your show topical even though it's a kids and family show no reason why it can't be world class uh, my name is jc sum i hope to see you on stage <laughs>